Could you talk about the very interesting process of collaboration with a filmmaker on and and how and and why and and, and even the the choice of the the TV the, this presentation oh, for yeah. these old days. Yeah. Well, the TVs um, me and a friend used to I don't know, it just slowly came together. The TVs I think were were just in 2017. Uh, it was the time that me and my other friend were obsessed with old, sorry, with old electronics, and then um, podcast with the professional television sets from the '90s and yeah, and early 2000s. So we did '80s and '90s, anyway. And then I had this idea during the during or oh, while creating the works for the urchins for that show in KL. I had this idea of a woman undressing. Well, not necessarily a woman, but it could be any gender. But basically, this person strip teasing awkwardly, like in amateur porn, and then once they completely undress, they're gone. Uh, created with Mark McDow, did a camera and our lighting assistant, um, Drew Espiritu, uh, the director. The location and the styling was Casey Del Rosario, who I would not have done it without. <laughs> and then um, Jim Lumbera, who's also been really good advisor, and who's also the one who edited it. And um, this is the first piece that I ever collaborated with someone, and I'm just happy because these people have been pretty recent in my life, but they've been so super supportive of the idea. And I just had an idea one night, and then we we're already doing it another night, you know. So I'm really glad with how it fell together. Moving on to the next paintings, they seem to be more rendered with less inhibitions. Perhaps is I'm not sure if that that would be accurate, but I would like to oh, talk yeah. about that and also your material: oil, crayon, graphite, on canvas. <laughs> Why do you use these materials? <laughs> I hoarded materials. <laughs> I'm I'm such a cheapskate on everything except food and drink. <laughs> I have my perfume, <laughs> food and drink. Yeah, it's all a man needs. But um, yeah, I've traveled a bit, and then when I see new material, I I just yeah, I just get the ones I like. Yeah, I, I get a lot, <laughs> and then and then I thought that. I should be experimenting more because if you look at my older works, they've been, you know, too refined, uh, too neat, although not that neat still. And I wanted to to break away from that. Also, I mean, for me, work is still a reflection of myself, you know, the the maker. And I wanted to do away with with that thought that. That something should be like this, you know, like strictly following uh, a routine or a guideline. I wanted to break out of that, so I tried to let go of my need for all the works, uh, a lot of drips, a lot of splatters, and and just building paint on top of paint, and then letting also the mistakes still be visible. I wanted the mistakes to be visible. Wanted it to be raw because I feel like with rawness, with not much planning, then I work from a subconscious that is easily more relate relatable to by other people who have not done the res the research I've had. Because all in all, I mean, painting is still about the affect, the emotion that it causes on the viewer, and I think to access. Affect to access emotion, one has to let loose. Last question. I was hoping you could share with us your thoughts about human intel. Oh well, the hum hu human primal instincts and animal intelligence, and and this painting is about maybe gestures, right? It's entitled mm -hmm. gestures. Isn't gestures, it? yes. Yeah. You know, because I uh, I read this book and for me it's been very formative. Like I read it in in Bataan, and yeah, like reading this book about human intelligence in a place of nature, human and animal intelligence. So 
So the book was propositioning that that the sign of intelligence first and foremost is play, play between two species. So for example, a good example, dogs maybe because they're so they're so when they play, they don't necessarily engage in acts of survival. They're not trying when they play with a stuffed toy. It's not that they're hunting something. It's not that they need to play with a stuffed toy for survival. Or when they play with another pup. They don't necessarily, you know, they're not necessarily fighting for for territory. But it is this certain play that it is this play that readies them for that. Except in the play they're enjoying, which is actually still not needed. And then from play with another being comes communication. So they're communicating verbal, nonverbal. Some of them talk by by scent. Like for example, cats do not they do not talk verbally. They only are they only meow towards humans, but towards themselves they don't meow against each other un- unless they're angry. So they mm-hmm. communicate non verbally, you know. And- I find very interesting because it's already in the realm of metaphysics. Mm-hmm. And Another artist aside from you, another art and formal artist, JC, he also believes in the animal intelligence. And we've been arguing so much about that. Um, but, <laughs> What's the arguments about? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think because humans are the only ones who can compose music and make works of art and build architecture. I was arguing on the side that there is no other, inte- only humans have intelligence, but a lot of proof have started coming out, which is coming from JC was telling me, a lot of proof has been coming out that animals are intelligent and they don't harm anybody. And even the, some researchers sent a drone to follow the movement of um, manta rays And because the manta rays did not sense a human presence, they would congregate in the thousands in the middle of the ocean. And uh, human humans have never seen that because I think they disperse when there is a presence of a human. But because it's a drone or some kind of robot, they could act like their normal selves. So that <laughs> whole topic I find extremely fascinating on what you're exploring on animals and humans. <laughs> yeah, no. But I mean, like for example, what were what were the examples that you mentioned? Like with music, music. I mean, for example, the bird, the songbirds copying others, which isn't really needed, or or the drumming of the black palm cockatoo, or even what's really interesting. What I read recently is the experiment on fungi. Apparently, they can problem solve. So if you give them a really complicated maze. And you put their choice of food in the others. They really think which ones, you know. They grow in this, and when they don't find it there, they go back, and then grow another way. So even these, you know, these very minute things that we don't notice have this sort of of problem solving. I mean, of course, crows and their tools and whatnot. I think there's much that we don't understand, and again, it still goes back to how we measure intelligence, intelligence, which is just based on our own version of it. And in, in fact, there's a certain word called Umwelt, this is German, U-M-W-E-L-T, which pertains to weak, to the fact, factor theory that we can never know what another being is thinking because we can never sense the world their own way. We are quite limited by our five senses. We don't have um, radars or supersonic, whatever. Um, uh, I, I think that by the fact that humans are trying to learn from animals, like how bee colonies work, how, or, well, how, how bees work, how beehives work, and, and even termites, silkworms, then mm. maybe it does say that they have a form of intelligence different from the humans that we could learn from. Mm, yeah, 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 definitely. Well, at least, I mean, if not learn from, at the very least, respect. Mm-hmm. You know, it should, which should be the basis. I remember reading from a book by, I'm forgetting the author, but it's about um, 
conservationist versus animal rights activist. And um, okay, it's a whole other topic, but basically there's this one line in the book that really interested me. And it's the basis for human rights is respect for non-human beings. Because if you don't respect non-human beings, why are you going to care about human rights? Um, will then your body of work and also going forward will be continually exploring these themes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm more into, but also I don't really know where I'm going <laughs> most of the time. And um, I used to think about it as being lost, but now I've, I've, I've rephrased that to finding my way. And I just hope that by the end of it all, it will all just make sense. I I want to let go of, like I stopped, for example, I stopped working for a specific theme in an exhibition. I want it to be more free flow. Like when I have an idea, I do my best to, to represent that idea immediately. This exhibition at Art Informal will be ongoing until February 6th.